good morning students sorry i couldn't be there because uh, i have to be at a phd defense this morning that uh, that had been scheduled for a while and uh, i couldn't set up a guest speaker to talk about this specific topic so let's jump right into it we're going to talk today about choice poetics and interactive narrative um, this is related to the two readings that that I've already assigned to you and is also related to your next assignment. What is choice uh, and why do we care about choice? All games have choices if you think about it because if you are comparing games to other media forms as we have been discussing, uh, one thing that is interesting or, or, or largely un undisputed is that if you watch a, a video, then it is pre-made in terms of the, the entire experience by, a, by an author, a designer, cinematographer, um, director, screenwriter. And as, as viewers, you don't have a choice in terms of where the story goes. Whereas in a game, uh, it allows you, maybe even in a very, very superficial way, the ability to give feedback so that that feedback is taken and uh, you have the opportunity to, to direct where, where the narrative goes or where the system goes in terms of changes of state. So, so for now, we will, we will see that you know, all games have choices, but what are choices? Um, uh, does choice simply mean interaction in a very simple way, or uh, are there uh, can can we look at different games and compare them in terms of how choices, how different choices impact um, player experience or preference for those games? So, so let's take this example. What differentiates the kind of choice that you have in Mario. So in, in this situation, in this particular state, a player has a number of controls, uh, running, jumping, movement, and so on. And with some combination of those, uh, their objective is to try to avoid the bullet while you know getting the reward that's, that's hidden in the question mark lock. Uh, while avoiding enemies. They also have various path, paths. Um, once they avoid bullet bill, they can keep going straight, uh, they can go down, they can go up the wine, and so on. So as a player, you have a number of choices that are implicit in, in the state and the interactions that are given to you, as well as um, a continuous uh, domain or, or a system that is given to you that you're manipulating by by interrupting it with input if you don't give any input then then the system will simply continue on uh, its, its its physics but there are other kinds of choices in this case uh, the example from from the walking dead you have dialogue choices these choices are fairly discreet and specific where you say well there's a very something very specific that i can make the character say and so i'm choosing between a number of these discrete specific choices so as i'm describing these two choices you can already start seeing that they're not similar choices in the sense that we can describe them in in ways in which we can start distinguishing between them so choice poetics is, is, is the study of how choices are different. It's a theory, it's a, it's a language or a taxonomy that, that gives us a way to evaluate choices across many different types of games and to look more at, at more detail into how uh, in similar games, similar kinds of choices bring about different kinds of experiences. So what is different uh, in case of playing Mario versus playing Sonic, where you're still playing a similar kind of game and you have similar kinds of choices, but you may have different experiences. 
and we call this choice poetics because poetics is a term that is uh, you that was used by aristotle for describing the properties of poetry and theater and in some ways choice poetics um, is uh, it is a link to say this these this is a way of describing properties of games. Um, what makes them good? What makes them um, engaging, interesting? All the terms that you know, fun. All the terms that we've been arguing about so far. Uh, but more specifically, we want to see how form and content work together to create different experiences. As you can see from these two examples, you know, choices in a platformer versus uh, versus a, a role-playing game uh, are very different, but still they they can be analyzed for the high-level experience uh, aspect for players. So our objective here for this for this topic and for this assignment is to recognize and name different types of choices in games, including what purpose they serve in both in communicating the designer's intention for what, what, what they're trying to communicate through their game and from the point of view of players in terms of what they want as their experience. So, so that's choices. Um, it's interesting to look at uh, narrative in general. Uh, so largely in games, you will see you will see that narrative is is used as as an intermission from interaction. So, for example, you know, in case of Mario, you play a level. Uh, at the end of the level, you succeed, and the narrative moves on. There's a little cutscene that plays, that then introduces the next world, and then you keep going. Uh, in dialogue segments, a lot of times you will have players that respond with arbitrary choices. Some of those in, in, in well-designed games uh, do have meaningful differences in the way those are interpreted in the narrative, but not often. But often we sort of see that there um, a lot of dialogue segments end up with um, choices that, that don't end up mattering to the overall narrative so so this is the advantages of narrative as intervention are at least from my point of view designers control so designers can control the narrative uh, more tightly if they can give players just enough interaction so that they're satisfied in terms of agency or, or, or face challenges uh, while still maintaining a coherent narrative. The disadvantage is that while players might enjoy the gameplay aspects, they may not actually you know, enjoy or agree with or feel like they don't have agency to actually change the narrative itself or the overall uh, plot of the game. And this has been a challenge for designers for a long time where there's this tension between how much agency to give players in terms of creating new story paths that are not all handcrafted or give them such a large space of decisions that um, they as they play they feel like they're actually making their decisions are, are, are changing the story um, or having an impact on, on how stories change in a more significant way than just trying to figure out the two possible stories that the designers would have imagined and, and we are trying to sort of through our decisions trying to find one of those two there's a much larger more flexible um, story space and and so this this general field includes includes many different types of experiences. There's interactive fiction, interactive storytelling, um, story games, electronic literature, and I will use the term umbrella term interactive narrative to include all of those uh, at different levels of interactions with a narrative. So this is sort of the motivation for 
course some of the work that that led to these two papers that you you've uh, hopefully read by now or at least skimmed through um, so we start with this question of what is a choice and how do we use how do we classify or differentiate between choices and come up with a language that allows us to allows us to discuss more deeply how games are different um, so one of the fundamental one of the fundamental sort of bases for this starts out with defining what a choice actually is so a choice is is is, is not just a, a single interaction. Um, it's a single interaction that has some sort of framing. So your jump in Mario uh, actually has a certain framing. Every jump is different. Uh, you have the affordance of jump or a mechanic of jumping, but when you choose to jump, when you choose to double jump in different contexts means different things. So framing is, uh, is what sets up the, the choice in a particular context. Options are options that are available to you. So for example, you, you may be in one of the underground levels in, in Mario where you have the choice to double jump, but you don't really have the option to do that because there isn't enough room to jump uh, between, the, between the panels, right? And then the outcomes, which is that once you make the choice, what happens in the game world that changes? What changes actually occur after you make the choice? So, um, so mostly, if you start thinking about now some of the terms that I brought in, um, for explicit or discrete choices, um, these would make sense. So here's an example. Um, there's a game called Fielder's Choice. It's on uh, choiceofgames.com where there are a number of these choice-based interactive narratives. It's, a, it, it's an excellent web website if you are a fan of interactive fiction um, where you look at this very specific situation. Right? So uh, I'm going to read from this. You were too young to remember this, but the first time you threw a ball, the air around it whispered a little, like so many spectators, coaches, scouts, and ball players to follow. The air had to gossip about the unexpected talent hidden within your arm. It was a little stuffed white ball with fake red stitches pasted onto it. You reached down, picked it up, and chucked it across your living room, even though you could barely walk. Which arm did you throw it? So here's a choice that is set that there's a framing about, about uh, this situation. And then you as a player are choosing now whether it was your right arm or the left arm. So the entire background text is, is the framing of this. Your options are to decide whether this character that that just got introduced to you is, is right-handed or left-handed. And depending on what you pick, these are the outcomes. And you can start seeing that they are exactly the same. And so we don't actually know immediately whether our choice of being right-handed or left-handed immediately has any impact. So here's another example. Um, you've somehow found your way to the center of the town. The glittering palace dominates the plaza. A haggard-looking signpost stands in the center of the pavement. Around it is a cluster of buildings, most of them abandoned-looking. You can make out an armory and a bank. So in this case, uh, let's identify the framing and options and likely outcome. So this is a game called Town by an Anthropy. And in this case, your entire text uh, in, 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 at the beginning 
sets you up. You found yourself in the, to the center of the town. And so that's the framing. You are in the center of the town. And now you can see that there are a number of things surrounding you. And the options that you have are the blue links, which will take, which will take you to either more information about the place or, or the place itself. And those are your options. And the likely outcomes are basically travel, right? So you click on armory or bank and, and you should you should expect the game to uh, to move it. So in this case, the framing is all the plain text text. The choices are the blue links and your outcomes are that your character moves to a new place on the map. So if you look at player experience in, in two different types of choices, um, then we can we can see how different the different ways in which choices are framed and are given to you can affect your overall player experience. So, so in in, in choice in the main choice poetics um, in the main choice poetics paper. Uh, Peter Mao Horter uh, and uh, and his uh, and his colleagues define uh, various dimensions of player experience, and so we'll talk about these briefly. Um, agency is the primary is the primary one because agency is uh, broadly defined as the player's ability to take action and the control they have over their actions. Influence is how much control do they have when they have the option to take action. There's transportation, which is um, whether whether choices are, are actually moving, um, moving you. There's autonomy, which is how much, um, which is related to agency uh, in some ways, agency is sort of the range of choices you have. Autonomy is 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 the is the freedom that you have of taking those choices. How much do you identify with the, with the character, sort of the world? Uh, how much responsibility is given to the player in terms of making the narrative successful through their choices, and how much regret for making uh, incorrect choices? So so based on these. Uh, there are a number of what are called sort of idioms, which is like the standard choices that we see reoccur in many, many games. So the relationship between the options that are provided and outcomes are, there are various idioms related to that. And there are actually fairly, there are some very straightforward ones that will uh, illustrate what, what these idioms mean. So there's a dead end option, which means that you have a choice, uh, you make a choice, you pick one of the options, and that leads to a dead end. And so this is one kind of idiom where you are given a choice and one of those options will just lead you to, to an abrupt ending. A false choice is when you, the player feels from the framing that they are making a legitimate choice that will change the way the narrative or the system will, will change, but there isn't actually a change. So they're given choice, which uh, leads to like no matter which choice they pick, they end up in the same state. A blind choice is one where the players do not actually know what the outcomes are. So the outcomes are completely hidden. In a dilemma, there are multiple outcomes, but there is no clear, there isn't sufficient information to the players that one outcome is clearly better. And often there are two outcomes with trade-offs. So there the player is in a dilemma in terms of what to trade off when they make their choice. A flavor choice is like, um, you know, choosing the color of your player's hat uh, or something where it's, it's for largely for decorative purposes and doesn't actually have impact in terms of gameplay mechanics. It could have an impact in terms of aesthetics if the player is choosing 
um, visual aesthetic that that appeals to them. There is a delayed effect in which uh, in, you, there is no immediate uh, communication of the outcome. Uh, the effect is of, is of, of a particular choice uh, comes out, or, or the outcome is shown to the player much later. There is a puzzle choice and an unchoice, uh, which are sort of unchoices when the player feels like they they would should have been given a choice, but they don't. Um, so, so that's that's the dead end. Uh, what is it useful for? Well, it introduces a challenge. It wants the player to explore an initial the initial content repeatedly. Uh, until they find the right the right uh, way, and so dead end option essentially connects with agency responsibility and regret, which is uh, that the players do have agency to take the action, but then uh, there is also failure, which means that they you sort of give the players the responsibility for choosing the option that led to failure and regret associated with it. Um, a false choice is where two choices lead to the same outcome. Um, it's useful to communicate that the player is powerless, even though uh, you know they they can they can do a bunch of low-level things in terms of options, but really the system is very, is powerful enough that it's gonna it's gonna update uh, the way it's supposed to. Um, false choices sometimes allow players to express themselves or role-play, where even though the players know that this is a false choice, they are going to play in a certain style, so that um, they they have the ability to to perform something um, as as they play, regardless of the outcome. And false choices have sort of lack of agency, uh, uh, but they also deal with identification in terms of sort of knowing that the choice isn't going to make an impact on the overall narrative or, or the outcome. Um, it allows players to identify with, with an option that they uh, they see fit to take. A blind choice is one where um, you don't actually know the outcome. And so if, if you make a choice and if both options are rewarded where you don't, you're uncertain about about the um, outcome in one of the choices, uh, then it encourages exploration. If one option is punished, then it leads to uh, an interesting sort of challenge where um, players will feel like they weren't given inform enough information to succeed and will fault the designer for, um, for that kind of punishment. And so there it's about autonomy, which is that I could make the choice, but um, uh, I'm not free to make that choice because I don't have enough information to be able to succeed and then regret that is caused as a result of it. A dilemma is interesting, like I mentioned earlier, that it's some sort of a trade war, trade off, which means that your, your choice leads to uh, some trade off between two objects that, you know, um, will 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 make you lose something. Um, so a lot of times, dilemma choices are used when when the designer were, wants the player to in in the character shoes uh, and and realize sort of where they have to compromise. Uh, it it often leads to leads them to think more carefully about a situation without without jumping into a choice. Um, the interesting thing is that dilemmas, even though they are, the, you know, for me, the, some of the most interesting choices are dilemmas, um, they need to be extremely well designed because they, they are informed choices where you clearly know the trade-offs, at least the short-term trade-offs. Um, otherwise, they feel like blind choices. And if that's the case, then then the regret of making the wrong choice is going to be higher. And in some ways, they're more interesting because they uh, relate to a lot of the different dimensions of player experience that, that we've been looking at. 
delayed effects are uh, effects that don't immediately show up. Uh, and unchoice is where there is no choice. I mean, you are essentially watching watching a non-interactive narrative, right? So then you would say, well, unchoice is kind of interesting. Why is it even useful? If, if you're talking about choices, then why is unchoice useful? Uh, it is useful because it it allows it provides this really interesting sort of mechanism to to the designer so that they can introduce things like pacing, where you you might actually want to slow down um, your your experience of the game by giving players a lot of unchoices in the sense that you, you're asking them to click on next and click on next and click on next right so it's really there is there is no choice there like you click on next to move forward and that's really the only thing you can pick you can you know you can go back sometimes um, but from a narrative perspective you don't have a choice that you don't you cannot make a choice that will change the game um, so, you know, like breaking up large chunks of text where you say next, next, next is uh, an unchoice. Uh, and a lot of times it's also to call attention to a specific word or phrase. And, uh, and a lot of uh, RPGs will have uh, text, chunks of text broken down, not only to make them, um, you know, constrained in terms of you know, how much text do you want players to read before engaging with the interaction again, uh, but also to, to highlight specific things um, as they read. So even, even if they don't read like three sentences on, on a dialogue page, uh, they at least get all the red colored ones, or all the blue colored ones that are highlighted. So, so there are a number of other choices, uh, choice poetics in the paper, it's not meant to be exhaustive. In fact, we are still constantly updating uh, choice idioms as well as the way in which um, choices are analyzed. Uh, but what we are hoping to get is um, a way in which there is a more, there is a, there's a standard uh, vocabulary around descriptions of choices and experience so that we can start drawing some general insights out of that. Uh, so uh, one kind of choice uh, that isn't described in the paper is sort of exploratory choice in which clicking on a link that is uh, signed as reversible uh, which allows players to essentially peek into, into the space and then undo uh, their action. So I will pause here and then switch uh, out to the next video for moving on to the next topic of branching narratives. Stay tuned.